Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. Well, we're, we're quick, well in front of this, uh, today's service. We're going to do this for our internet guests um, who watch our program. Uh, we are inviting you to join with us uh, in assisting us in reaching the world with the, the gospel uh, with our outreach with uh, the internet uh, programs we put out there and uh, we we uh, I think we get somewhere around a thousand hits a month is that right brother Bill okay um, of people watching and so we're glad you're getting ministered to we're asking you if you would uh, uh, as in your heart and you would think it'd be appropriate to help support us in what we're doing um, you can do that several ways. One, you can go to our website of www.fvc.org. Click on the donations tab or the online giving tab. I'm not sure how it's worded, but it's one of those things. Uh, that goes through a PayPal account. Uh, other ways is you can just do it through snail mail. You can, you can send an offering through, uh, to P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, uh, 27417. That's, uh, and, of course, Faith and Victory Church. And the third way is you can email us your phone number. We will, send, we will not call you. We won't, we won't try to check. We will send you a square cash invitation where you can set up and give that way. Uh, that would be the only purpose in that. We will not be hunting you down. We won't be calling you up saying, hey, hounding you. But if you want to use a, your phone your, with a smart app called Square Cash, uh, we can send, if you send us your phone, then we can send you an invitation. And typically when we send an invitation like that, you get $5 for giving. We give $5 for inviting you. And it's a win-win. Hallelujah. So if everybody did that, every, for everybody that, that does that, it's about 1,000 hits a month. So if everybody did that, uh, you could send us $5 without losing anything because you get $5 back. We get $5 for inviting you. It would be a win-win all the way around. So, uh, but again, you could do that. Uh, text, or not sorry, you could email donations at fvc.org and uh, send your phone number, and we will uh, send you an invitation to Square Cash, and then they, they get that all set up, and then you can uh, give with your smart app, all right? So we would love to have you partner with us in what we're doing around the world, reaching all over the world, a different day, China. We're going to China. We're going to Africa. We're going to Europe. Uh, we're going to South America. Our program is seen all over the world. I think last time we had it, like 42 nations are watching our program. So that's, we're, we're touching people. You can say, we're not, we don't have as many right here, but we're touching people around the world. Amen? Glory to God. All right, let's get into today's sermon. Go ahead and open your Bibles to the 30th chapter of the book of Deuteronomy. We're going to be talking about today and next week. There's no way we're going to get through this today. Uh, making right decisions, or as my sermon title for this is, Decisions, Decisions, Decisions. Hallelujah. We're going to talk about the fact that God, that choices we make in life bring blessing or they bring cursing. That, that is just a fact of life. We need to make the right choices. Everybody said, I need to make the right choices. And God gave us the right to choose. Now, if, you're, if you've been brought up with, a, with a, um, a Calvinist mindset, which is, you know, Calvinism is an extreme mindset, so is Arminianism. Uh, you, get on, you get on either side of that equation, and you're all over in the extreme on both of them. Hallelujah. But Calvinism, you know, extreme, particularly hardcore Calvinism, it's, it's all about sovereignty. You know, you got God's unresistible grace. In other words, he makes you get saved. He makes you receive his grace, okay? The ones who don't, he chose for them not to get it, all right? No, God gave us the right to choose. He, made us, he, he gave us the, the ability to make a choice, uh, even in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve. <clears throat> but Deuteronomy 30, 19 and 20, uh, um, Joshua, bringing uh, the children of Israel up, and, you know, went, well, actually, let's go to Deuteronomy and just back up a few verses there, because there, there, are, there are several... Uh, couple things right here in this one. Amen. Deuteronomy 30. Um, we can back up into about verse 15. See, I've set before thee this day life and good and death and evil. Now, God says, well, I've set before you life and good and death and evil. Listen to what happens here. Uh, in, 
in that I commanded this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways, to keep his commandments, his statutes, his judgment. You may live and multiply, and the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land whither thou goest to possess it. But if thy heart turn away. Now listen, he set before him what? Life and good, death and evil. There's a choice there. Amen? And he commands you today to love, your, love God, to walk in his ways, keep his commandments, his statutes, his judgments. Why? That you may live and multiply. See, life happens good when we do what God said. All right? But if you turn your heart away so that you will not hear, but shall be drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I denounce you this day. Yeah, that's what I said. I denounce you that you shall surely perish and that you shall not prolong your days upon the land whether thou passest over Jordan to possess it. I call heaven and earth the record this day against you. Now, that's kind of a way of saying, listen, here's a testimony. I'm, I'm, I'm declaring, you know, before heaven and earth, here's what I'm telling you, okay, that I set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Listen to this. Therefore, choose life. Hey, dummy, if you can't figure it out on your own, life and death, blessing and cursing, choose life. I mean, it's not complicated. Say, it's not complicated. That's not hard, though. I mean, we should have figured that one out by ourselves. But in case you can't figure that one out, choose life. All right? Why? Choose life that thou and thy seed may live. That thou mayest love the Lord thy God, that you mayest obey, <laughs> underline obey. It's a four-letter word, I know. His voice, that you mayest cleave unto him, for he is thy life. And the length of thy days. Now listen, where is the length of your days? It's not, in a, it's not in a protein shake and it's not in, I'm not, a, listen, I'm not knocking eating right and eating good. But we got all these people, I remember a few years ago back on one of the local stations here, Christian station. They had a program and they got caught. People get, keep, well, Christians are so gullible. We'll start taking having infomercials because it raises money. On our Christian stations, you know, drink this particular type of, you know, this thing and drink this thing and, you know, and, and, and you're going to be healthy and live long. No, God's the only thing. No, listen, I don't mean eat bad. Right. You can't eat, you can't eat, uh, uh, well, pork rinds, well, I ain't going to eat them anyway. Chitlins, you know, I think stripe uh, for cows, you know, you can't be eating all them intestines, uh, you know, liver, I mean, not just liver, but, uh. A pancreas, we call it sweet bread. Some of y'all remember old country called pancreas sweet bread. Yeah. And, um, yeah. Some of y'all don't even know that, did you? See? I'm more country than you thought I was, ain't I? <laughs> Some of you thought I was, I, I didn't know anything about country living. Hallelujah. No, the Lord is the length of our days. Our faith needs to be in God. Yeah, we need to do proper things, but, you know, don't buy into everything that comes on television. And then, and then whatever Christian network starts selling, whatever, there's a kickback going on. And they're trying to get you to buy this particular product, and they get all caught up in that stuff and get caught up in you buying this and buying that and doing this and doing that and forget to preach the gospel. Amen. Amen. God's the length. And listen, I'm, I'm, I'm not against eating right. Okay. Uh, he's the length of thy days, that thou mayest dwell in the land which the Lord swear unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. So here we have, the, Joshua tells the people, he says, you know, uh, here, here's your, not, not Joshua, I'm sorry. Um, I forgot who this one was. I, I, didn't, I didn't get back that far when I was studying this. Hallelujah. I was just, I kind of, Joshua's in the next book. <clears throat> Joshua gets before everybody in Joshua 24, 15, and says, um, and tells him, you know, if you think it's evil to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you'll serve. Verse 15 of Joshua 24, whether the gods of your fathers that were on the other side of the flood, the gods of the Amorites, the land you dwell in, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And he goes on down through verse 22 with this. So here we have a God telling us what? We have a choice. Everybody say, I got a choice. You get to choose whether you get good and evil, blessing or cursing. If you make the wrong choices, don't expect the other results. Hello. Don't expect the results. Well, let's put it this way. If you plant corn, don't expect tomatoes. You're foolish if you expect to get tomatoes if you plant corn. Am I right, Benny? If, oh, let's do it this way. Don't plant potatoes expecting to get to get tomatoes. Different kind of seed, different kind of harvest. Don't expect to plant evil 
and death and get the life and blessing reward. It doesn't work that way. Now choose you this day. Choose which one. So we have to make decisions. Now look, there, there are guys in the Bible who made some bad decisions. Number one. Brrr, choo, I'm trying to get a drummer up there and do a drum roll. Adam. Garden of Eden. What happens? Adam, in, in, not even in deference to, but in spite of the bozos who drew the quarterly Sunday school pictures from my denomination back when I was a kid, the Adams over on the other side of the garden fishing in a pond somewhere, and Eve reached over his shoulder with a piece of fruit that he's about to eat and mess everything up. It didn't happen that way. And, and you know, why, I don't know why that, that one Sunday school picture that we're supposed to take home in color has stuck in my mind my whole life. That had to be over 50 years ago. I can't even think of another one I ever did. But that one has stuck. <clears throat> and it's so, it's so biblically in, uh, in error that it's not even funny. The Bible says she turned and gave the fruit to him, to Adam, and he did eat, and he was with her. It says, in the New Testament, it says he was with her when it happened. What was he supposed to be doing? I take authority over you, Satan, and I cast you down, and I subdue you. Instead, he goes, Ow! Oh, he's naked! Hide! The Lord's on the way. Hello. And then we have the first pass the buck job in the history of man. God comes down and says, Adam, where are you? He says, oh, well, we hid ourselves. We were naked. Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten of the fruit? Yeah. The woman. Are you ready for this? I mean, you talk about brassy. The woman you gave me gave me the fruit and I did eat. So really, I'm a victim here. I am the victim of you giving me this woman. <coughs> Think about that. God comes down and Adam gets caught with his hand in the cookie jar, red-handed, and turns around and plays the victim role. Because if you hadn't given me that woman, we wouldn't be here right now. It's God's fault. I said it's God's fault. According to Adam. Hello? Well, it wasn't God's fault. Then we go over to, um, <laughs> we get over to um, uh, Saul. Now remember, Saul has been made king of Israel, and he's, been ordered by God to go out to the Amicites, or the Amorites, one of the ites, termites, Amorites, Hittites, Jebusites, you know, and you know, like, and then you got the creeps, everything that creeps on the earth was supposed to have authority. Everybody Harris one time said, he said, thank God we got authority over creeps, everything that creeps on the earth. Hallelujah. But you know, he, he's supposed to go out and kill the Amorites. Now listen, God told them to, not, to bring nothing back. Don't bring back any spoil. Don't bring back any cattle. Don't bring back any people. Kill them all. Kill the king. Kill the whole group. All right, so Saul goes out, comes back. He keeps Agag, the king, alive. The people take the best of the spoil. Now, I, the reason I believe he kept Agag alive is he wouldn't know where the gold and the silver was. He, he wanted to add to his treasury. So Saul gets woke up in the middle of the night by the Lord and says, it repents me that I made Saul king. Actually, if you look there in, in uh, 1 Samuel 15, uh, I know it may have been a little chilly earlier. Ain't no mo. All right. Um, First Samuel 15, verse 11. It repenteth me that I set up Saul to be king, for he has turned back from following me and hath not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried to the Lord all night. And then as Samuel rose early the next morning, it was told Samuel, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he has set up a place and has gone about and passed on and gone down to Gilgal. And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said, oh, praise God, here comes the prophet. 
Blessed be thou of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. Now let me tell you something. When you give into disobedience, you give into deception too. I said when you give into disobedience, you will get into deception. You'll begin to justify all your actions as okay. They, you know, they, they're all right. There's nothing wrong with anything I'm doing. Hello? And so Samuel goes, now he, he, Saul goes, hey, I did just what the Lord said. And Samuel goes, really? Uh, could you please explain, I'm paraphrasing, but could you please explain the bleeding of the sheep and the lowing of the oxen? If you did what the Lord told you to do? Well, Saul goes, well, they brought them up from the Amalekites. Oh, it was the Amalekites, okay. For the people, the, the people, here we go, pass the buck. The people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen. Listen, oh, now we're going to spiritualize it to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God. And the rest we utterly destroyed. Now, wait, no, wait, no, God didn't say keep the best of sacrifice. God said take it all out. Saul gets caught with both his hands in the cookie jar. Hello? And, but, he, but he, first of all, before, he, before you know, he's kind of got his hands in the jar going like this. I ain't done nothing. What do you mean? He said, I did what the Lord told me to do. And Saul's like, dude, I hear him right over there. How stupid of, you, of a prophet do you think I am? I mean, look, the Lord's been in my face all night about you. Hello? So then Saul goes, well, you know, the people, and bless their hearts, they had a good intention. They wanted to sacrifice to the Lord. If you're buying that, I got oceanfront property in Oklahoma. I would love to sell you. Oceanfront. Yeah, cats are ready to buy it. Even after his team almost gave their game away last night. They, they tried everything. They still won. And Samuel said to Saul, stay here. In other words, and I will tell thee what the Lord has said to me this night. And he said, say on. He knows he's in trouble. When you were a little in your own sight, were you not made head of the tribes of Israel? And the Lord anointed thee king of Israel. <clears throat> the Lord sent thee on a journey and said, go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they be consumed. Wherefore, then didst thou not obey, listen to this, obey the voice of the Lord and didst evil, I mean, and didst fly upon the spoil and didst evil in the sight of the Lord. Now listen, Saul is not out raping women. There's not, he's not uh, molesting children. He's not doing all kind of perverse things we could think of and, and call that evil. What did God call evil? He did not obey his voice. I said he did not obey his voice. And God called that evil. Wow. Wow. I know there's a whole new narrative out there about, you know, I don't have to obey and I don't have to submit because I'm under, a, a, you know, this special thing called, you know, radical grace. <coughs> God looked here and the man simply did not obey him and he called it evil. Hello? And he had, and he had some pretty good, I mean, uh, he was quick on his feet to come up with these, these reasons. You know? And Saul goes, yeah, I obeyed the Lord. I go on the way, I go on the way which the Lord sent me, brought Agag the king of the Amalekites, and utterly destroyed the Amalekites. Uh, but the people, now, isn't this funny? He's supposed to kill the king. He's supposed to kill all the people. And he just goes, I took the king, and the people took the spoil. Now he's, he's passing the buck off on the sheep and the oxen, the sheep and the things which should have been, uh, which should have been utterly destroyed, but what? And so he's, here he is, he's back, feeling, yeah, they should have, but, they did it to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God. Folks, I'm telling you, people come up with all kinds of stuff. Are you here? I'm going to sell drugs and tithe to the Lord. I mean, my intentions are good, folks. Are you all here? I mean, I've got good intentions. I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, I mean, somebody's going to sell the drugs to the people. So I'm going to at least give the, the, the tithe to the Lord. 
See, when God tells you not to do something, there is no alternative to make it right. When God gives you a command, there are no alternatives to his command that make, it, make not, not doing it right. And no matter how you spirit, and we charismatic word of faith uh, people are the best at spiritualizing stuff. I mean, making it sound so good. And it's garbage. Why? Because it's in disobedience to what it's, the Lord said. As I, 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 it's like a, about a month and a half ago, I read this article somewhere, and there's this man and this woman. And I'm telling you, it, it's the stupidest thing I've ever. I mean, you know, there's things that are evil. This is just stupid. They are swingers. They're married. And they are using wife swapping or partner swapping. In other words, he, him and her, her go find a couple. They switch off. They have sex. And then they try to lead him to the Lord. Because what better way to show the love of God than to have sex with somebody? And then share Jesus with them. I got one for you. Don't fornicate. Bible. Obey. You can't spiritualize it. Well, I led him to the Lord. I don't believe you led him to the Lord. I'm sorry. You can't use the wrong premise and go get people saved. You're just finding a way to satisfy your carnal lust and your, your, your out of control lust and put it under a spiritual thing. Just like they did here, they brought the, they didn't bring the best back to sacrifice the Lord. They brought the best back. They may sacrifice it, but they're going to eat the lamb and they're going to eat the oxen and they're going to, they're going to get some food out of this deal. And Saul kept Agag alive because he's going to interrogate it to find out where the gold is. Had nothing to do with a spiritual reason. But now they're trying to spiritualize why they disobeyed and make it okay. You can't do it. There is no spiritual recourse to making disobedience okay. Everybody grin. Bobble head for me. Come on. All right. Are you here? Did y'all turn the heat off? Okay. All right. Hallelujah. Maybe I'm feeling the wrath of all the people hearing this right now that don't like it. All right. But the people took the spoil, the sheep, the ox, and the chief of the things which should have been sacrificed and utterly, or he should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice it unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal. And Samuel said, here we go. I'm telling you, we need more of this kind of preaching in the church. Hath the Lord a great, as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better. Everybody say better than sacrifice. And to hearken than the fat of rams. Listen to verse 23. This, this, will, this will frost your Wheaties or take it back off. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Amen. People run around with that rebellious devil on that rebellious spirit, re resisting and being stubborn and rebellious, and God's not pleased with it. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. His disobedience cost him his kingdom. He, won't, he, he wasn't embezzling from people. He wasn't raping women. He wasn't killing children. I mean, he was, he was, he, he, his disobedience to what God said do cost him his kingdom. Just disobedience. And we come along now in the New Testament and think, I don't have to obey. Because no matter what I do, God's going to bless me anyway. And I'm telling you, I'm sorry. When God tells you to do something, you do it. And when God tells you not to do something, you don't do it. But I'm under grace. Yeah, and his grace will empower you to obey him. Not be a cover for disobeying him. If you're, at, uh, if you're operating in the grace of God, then you will be operating in obedience to God. It will not be your cloak and your, your, your shield to disobey. And everybody said, ouch. This is the quietest Pentecostals I've ever preached to. Come on now. 
if we don't if we don't get some cooler in here, I'm going. Mm. Next, Bible care. You might turn the air conditioner on there for a minute, Joe. I'm telling you, it's it's hot. I'm just like I'm, I'm can't hardly breathe up here. If you if you're cold, come on up front, sit right on up here, and we'll get you warm in a hurry. Now let's go look over here in Second Samuel. Now write this down: Second Samuel chapters eleven and twelve. We're not going to read all that. It's too much to read, um, but you're going to get there. And we're and we're going to kind of get through this this morning, and then we're going to close it. And then next week we're going to pick up with uh, how how to make right choices, why we must make right choices. But Second Samuel eleven. Hallelujah. We'll read just a little bit here, starting in chapter 11, verse 1. It says here, it says this. Came to pass after the year was expired, at the time when kings go forth to battle. Underline that. At the time kings for, go forth to battle. Now what happens at this time of the year? Kings do what? That David. Who is David? So what's David supposed to be doing? Going forth to battle. Isn't that right? It says, at the time that uh, came to pass, after the year had expired, that at the time the kings go forth to battle, that David, now David's the king. So David's supposed to be going forth to battle. Sent Joab and his servants with him and all of Israel, and they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. And David tarried still at Jerusalem. Man, they're out there winning battles. He's staying home. And it came to pass in an evening tide, that's late in the afternoon, David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself. Now last time I checked, people don't take a bath with your clothes on. So we could probably say this woman was butt naked. All right? And the woman was very beautiful to look upon. And we probably know this because David took a good long look. And David sent, and this is not, listen, I'm, I'm going to share this with you. Some people, people Hollywood has painted David and Bathsheba as a love story. It is a lust story. Amen. It is not a heat of the moment story. This is calculated and planned. Amen. Hello. Inquired after the woman, and one said, is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, or Eliam the wife of Uriah, the Hittite? And the, uh, listen. David sent messengers and took her. She came in unto him, and he lay with her, and she, for she was purified from her uncleanness. And she returned unto her house, and the woman conceived and sent and told David and said, I am with child. Let's make that real simple. She sent word back, you got me knocked up, my husband ain't here. There's a big problem. Because, see, he's out doing what you're supposed to be doing. Now, do you know we would not ever have known the word Bathsheba had David not sent Joab, but David went to battle. He made, now listen, you got to, I've got to believe that this is the, that, that God's plan was for David to go. And so David stayed behind. Everybody say David stayed behind. Bad decisions open the door to bad consequences. Hello. Are you here? Now, let me, let me say this. You know, I mean, I know uh, uh, years ago, about the only way that you could see soft porn and justify it was have HBO. I mean, really, I mean, they, they put all kinds of stuff on HBO. Now, I've never had it. I won't, won't even take it when they offer it to you for free for three days. Why? You don't need it in your house. Hello. I mean, you can be watching the PG-13 program. Right after that comes on the, you know, I mean, the Marvin Gaye show. Let's get it on. Are you here? So we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and, make no, and have no confidence in the flesh. What's that? You don't make provision to the flesh. 
Now, had David done his duty and done what he was supposed to be doing, he would not have been there when Bathsheba was taking a bath. Now, well, why was she up there naked? Because the people were supposed to be fighting. Her husband was. And it was the time that the kings went to battle. She probably felt safe in getting her bath out that day. But lo and behold, King Davy made a decision not to do what he was supposed to do. And then what happened? Because he made a decision not to do what he was supposed to do, he was faced with a temptation. She was very beautiful to look upon. And I'm guessing he was taking a good, solid, I mean, I, mean, I don't know if he had tele, uh, microphone, um, um, telescopes or binoculars in them days, but I got to tell you, he was, he, was getting a guy, he was getting his eye full. And instead of running away from there and saying, oh man, I shouldn't have done that, or sending word, you know, the king's in town, you probably need to you know, not do that. He wants to find out who she is. And then when he finds out who she is, he sends his service over there to get her. And now he takes advantage of his position of authority. Hello? And I call this, uh, I call this, this has become a new word. He, he used authority to rape her. He uses authority, his position to rape her. She had no choice. He's the king. Hello. Well, she gets pregnant. Now, Uriah ain't been there in a while. I mean, they've, they've besieged places. They've taken places. I mean, you know, David is just ha hanging out at the palace, chilling. He finds out she's pregnant. He sends a letter out to the, to the commander and says, hey, send Uriah home. Now, again, he makes it sound good. You know, he wants to inquire after the battle. So Uriah comes in. He inquires after him. How's it? Well, okay, well, like, good buddy. Like, I'm, I'm glad things are going great. You know, he's trying to get, he's, what he's trying to do? Go home. Now, he's figured this guy's been out on the battlefield a few weeks, months, whatever, how long they've been fighting. Hadn't seen his wife in a while. Hormones will take over. He'll have, have sex with his wife. Mr. Honorable, he gets, he gets Eagle Scout of the century. Okay? So Mr. Eagle Scout goes home. He won't go in his house. Why? Because it's out of integrity for him to go sleep with his wife while his fellow soldiers are out there fighting. He won't do it. He sleeps outside all night. Servants had followed to make sure he went into the house with his wife so they could blame the child on him. Premature, something like that, you know. Yeah, that's right. They couldn't do a DNA test. I mean, he don't even look like you. That don't matter. That's your baby. That's a recessive gene. Looks like the king. I can't help it. Don't look, I mean, it ain't, it ain't, yeah, anyway. So, David calls him back over the next night. Gets him slopping drunk. Figures if he can get him inebriated enough, then he'll want to go home and, and his integrity will get washed down with, you know, that, that drunken state. Well, what we found out was that the true integrity and character of the man was what really, he wouldn't sleep with his wife while his fellow soldiers were fighting because when in an inebriated state, he still wouldn't do it. His, that was his character. And so the servant comes back and says, hey, uh, boss, I know you got him drunk. He didn't do it again. Okay? So then David begins. So first of all, he's, he's, he's um, disobeyed God. And by disobeying God, he made the decision not to go. He disobeyed God. Secondly, he went and saw that woman naked. And in, instead of making the decision to walk away from that and have, have send word for her, have her covered up, he has her come over to the palace. When he gets her over to the palace, he, he, he has sex with her. He gets her pregnant. Calls her husband. Commits. Uh, he starts in on Reagan Gate. I mean, on, on, on Nixon Gate. He says he's the original Watergate. He's going to pull the cover up. Okay? He's going to cover this thing up. So he has her husband come home, tries to get him to sleep with her. He won't sleep with her. So now he's gone from, from a conspiracy to cover up. He's going to get involved in a conspiracy to commit murder. He writes a letter to the, to the captain and says, uh, when, when uh, the next battle, I want you to take Uriah, put him right in the middle of the hottest part of the battle, and then withdraw from him. What's that? An Obama Hillary gate. Benghazi. They hung those guys out to dry and let them get murdered. Why? Because there's something that they knew that they didn't want coming back here to the American public. And it had to do with some kind of underhanded stuff that, 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 that was going on. And that, that ambassador knew about it. They just hung them out to dry. The seals were ordered 
not to go down to the embassy and try to retrieve those people. And they finally said, forget it, we're going anyway. Cost them their life. We wouldn't give them support. What happened? They withdrew from them in the heat of the battle, and they fell, to, they fell victim to it. So what just happened in Benghazi happened here with David. Amen. Put him in the heat of the battle and withdraw from him. We got your back. We got your back. Back up, guys. Back up, guys. Next thing you know, he's out there all by himself. And he's dead. Word comes back to Bathsheba. She goes in the morning. After her morning, David brings her over to the palace and makes her his wife. You, I mean, right now, he's, he's, he's pretty much in scumbag status right now. All right? David, now, here's the thing. When you disobey and you begin to create your own little world, you think you get away with it. You think nobody was watching. Nobody caught me. Uriah got killed in battle, so he's a hero. Amen. He came home. Now, me and my servant know Uriah didn't go in the house, but nobody else knows that he didn't go in the house. So the baby, the king out of compassion, has brought her over to the palace because her husband's a national hero. He got, fight, he got killed fighting for the nation. Can you see how this is going on? And he's sitting on his throne one day, and lo and behold, Nathan shows up. Like I said, not my Nathan, the prophet Nathan. All right? Mine would probably come in, come in as the minstrel. Had Dick, had Dick and Dano coming in behind, you know, we all the stuff. You know. no. Nathan shows up and says, hey, Dave's like, hey, hey, Nathan, what's up? And he goes, I got a parable. Go ahead. Well, there was a guy in a city who was very, very rich, had everything he needed, could get anything he wanted. And he's going to throw a party for a guest one day. And, uh, and instead of going out to his stockyard and getting one of his lambs or one of his oxen or one of his sheep, getting something that he already had, there was a guy across town who didn't have anything but one little lamb. And he went over to that guy's house and took that one little lamb and offered it and cooked it and fed his guests with it. David got ticked. See, when you think you get away with stuff, you categorize that and you compartmentalize it and you think it is just, you don't even relate to stuff anymore. And David's sitting there and he gets up and he goes, as the Lord lives and as my soul lives, that man shall surely die. And Nathan goes, you be the man. Wake up time. You didn't get away with anything. The Lord your God. Look, 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 Mr. Harp guy out there with the sheep back when you were a kid. You forgot about the early days when you spent time with the Lord. You got so caught up with being king and the power and got so caught up with being you that you didn't think you had to obey God anymore. He's watching everything you're doing. And you preachers think you're getting away with everything and think that you're doing all this stuff and nobody knows about it and you're getting away with it. Let me tell you something. The same God that sent Nathan has a Nathan to come to your life. You better straighten it up. And David got up off the throne and began to repent. And the, and, the, and, the, and the judgment of God came. That child will die. And though David besought the Lord and sackcloth and ashes in mourning for days to, for that child not to die, that child died. And let me say something. We would not, and here's, here's another thing. We would have never had Solomon had David. Well, that was, that was God's plan. Nope. Solomon is a demonstration that God can restore even in the most broken circumstances. I heard somebody say one time that, you know, uh, David just got ahead of God with Solomon. Can I shake my head enough? It had nothing to do with David getting ahead of God. God came in and demonstrated he can restore. Solomon is the restoration, not the, not the purpose. Solomon was never the end of David's life. It was not, that was not what God was doing. David and Bathsheba were never intended to be a Hollywood movie story. That we can all talk about the love, you know, the love of David and Bathsheba. It was the lust of David for Bathsheba. We know. Hi. He looked on her and she was beautiful to look at. When he found who she was, called her over. And the first thing he thought about doing was having sex. Actually, he thought about that before he called her over. That's why he wouldn't know who she was. 
Now what happened here, folks? The decision to disobey opened the door to temptation. The temptation opened the door to um, adultery. The adultery opened the door to a cover-up. The cover-up opened the door to the conspiracy to commit murder. All because when the time of the year for the kings to go forth to battle came, David, instead of fulfilling his duty and obey God, sent Joab. And it looked good. Joab's winning the battles. So you can't go and make wrong decisions and disobedient decisions and violate God's word decisions and just because things look good, think that, okay, that means God's okay with it. I mean, Saul, I mean, Saul's sitting out there, he's got a gag, probably ever got the torture team working on him. Where's the gold? Where's the gold? Stick his uh, toothpicks up under his fingernails. I mean, you know, whatever. Where's the gold? Where's the gold? People over there, you know, uh, getting the meat ready to salt down for the winter or whatever. Saul shows up. Oh, we're going get to get the fire for the sacrifice going, guys. Come on. The prophet showed up. See, the thing about it, those, those prophets, they didn't give a rip about how you marketed it. They didn't care how you dressed it up. They didn't care how you packaged it. They didn't care how you covered it up and quote the love of God. You're doing all this because of the love of God. You're disobeying God and calling it, well, I'm doing it because I love God or it's the love of God. God's love doesn't give you or advocate you from doing what he told you to do. Because really, you know what the Bible says first? Are you ready? Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, thy soul, and thy strength, and thy neighbor as thyself. What's first? Loving God. What did he tell, what did he tell uh, Peter and them? If you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me. You can't skirt the commandments that you're to obey because you love God by saying you love people and that's why you're doing what you're doing. Can't do it. And people do it all the time. They're doing things that they're not supposed to be doing. They're doing things God's moral code says don't do. They're doing all kinds of things that the Bible says don't do. They're making decisions to disobey God and then calling it the love of God for people. Because I'm reaching out to them by doing this. Swapping your wife off so you can have sex with another woman so you can lead her to Jesus. I mean... I don't know if that qualifies for stupid on steroids. It may, it may qualify for complete lack of gray matter inside your head. Hello. Now people, you know, we go, why don't you go shoot up with the drug addict so you can show them the love of Jesus. I noticed that always when people are doing that kind of stuff, it never hurt. It never brings harm to them. It always brings pleasure to them. Well, we're going to drink, you know, we're going to drink a, a six-pack widget while we worship the Lord. Sucking down the suds, baby. I want to share Jesus with you. All the things in the Word of God that God tells us. Now, I know people right now, there's so many things the Bible is telling us not to do. And then people are doing it and saying, it's because they love people. And you stiff, you religious, you haters. Because you don't support us in our disobedience to God because we're loving people. Your love for people cannot be correct, cannot be biblical, and cannot be productive unless you first love God and do what God said. It starts with loving God. And God has demands. Are you putting this on? No, 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 no. God has demands, and God sent his grace to empower you to do those commands. So he didn't make you do it by, without his strength and his ability, but you still got to do it. Amen? All right, we got to stop here. I cannot go any further. Sorry. I'll throw one more out at you, and we're not going to cover it. Israel wanted a king. They want to be like all the other nations. Want to be like everybody else. 
I'm tired of being a Christian where I can't do like everybody else does. Oh, so you, your wife's going to have a pole dancing party at the church with the church leaders uh, to celebrate her birthday. Woo! The pastor's wife. Pole dancing. So because we, we, we should be a different. We're not like other people. Come out. Now, this is New Testament. Come out from among them and be ye separate and touch not the unclean things, saith the Lord. We are different. It's time that we stop trying to be not different and be different. Hello? Oh, we, we got we to gotta be like the world so we can win the world. We are not the world. Amen. Now, Jesus went and sat in his rabbinical clothing with the sinners. We have no testimony that Jesus put on fisherman gear or tax collector gear or sons of thunder gear. <laughs> Hallelujah. And went out and hung with the sinners. We, we know that they called him Rabboni, Rabbi. We know that uh, from that, because he was a teacher, he went to the synagogues and taught. He, he obviously wore rabbinical clothing. His clothing was so fine that the, the, the uh, kind of shawl thing he wore was so fine, the Roman soldiers cast lots to get it and wouldn't let him cut it because it was, it was hand-woven, one piece of material. He didn't have a seam. Jesus did not act like the sinner although he went and ministered to the sinner. Why? Because he pleased his father. He walked in his father's moral code. He honored the father with his life. And even in that, I asked, I asked Shannon this morning, because I, I kind of, sometimes I, just, I have these thoughts when we're riding, we're riding to Winston. I said, do you think Jesus marketed himself real well? Or did he walk in an anointing and power with a message of liberty and freedom that drew people? Which do you think it was? Because let me tell you something. His marketing team was Peter, James, and John. <laughs> now we know, fish, we know Peter, he cuts the guy's ear off at the, when they come to arrest Jesus. After three and a half years of walking with Jesus, the first thing he thinks of, cut somebody's ear off. Peter, go get the ear. Bring it to me. And James and John's father was named Zebudee, which meant thunder. They were the sons of thunder. That's your marketing team. Hello? Jesus goes out into the marketplace. All the people push up against him. A woman shows up one day with an issue of blood, touches him, virtue goes out of him. And he says, who touched me? And they go, uh, hey, Jesus. Oh. They're like the Eminem guys. <laughs> you know. Are we in a, why is it still ticking? They're like, you know, everybody's touching you. So you know what? Jesus wasn't marketed. He got noised abroad because of what was in him and through him. Not because he was good at putting himself on television and putting the right look on him. And because he was able to, every time somebody walked in, they immediately got put in a position in the church because they hooked them. That's how they hook them. Hello? Put them up in front of the church, let, them, let everybody see them. And you get hooked. So you're using marketing skills. They're using techniques to hook people. But I want to ask you something. Did Jesus do that or did Jesus hook them with the word and the anointing? He had no form, no comeliness that we should desire him, Isaiah 15 says. I mean, Isaiah um, 52 says. There was no form nor comeliness that we should desire him. He wasn't marketable. And besides, he, even if he was, with those guys being the marketing team, it wouldn't have worked anyway. You know what I'm saying? I mean, talk about just totally destroying something with your marketing aspect. They, they would do it. You know? Really? Praise God. We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 
27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.